Hello and welcome to the Art Department Podcast. My name is Jan Urschel and with me is Emmanuel Shu and a very special guest today. And we are at episode 22 already and I'm going to throw it over to Emmanuel right away and he can introduce us to our special guest. So as everybody can see, is, uh, our special guest is Jason Shire and I hope I said that right, uh, your last name. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we're going to jump into this, but, you know, as usual, I always want to tell you guys why I really wanted to have Jason on um, as a guest. And I remember I was I called him maybe a couple months ago uh, to ask him some questions about the animation industry. And uh, I was really it was a great chat, but also I had a lot of really informa good information. Uh, but I had, there was one thing that stuck in my mind that I couldn't forget uh, because, uh, it, you know, and we'll get into this later, but it, it was a little different from what I thought um, or how I uh, treated things. And it was about having your own personal voice over technical skill. Like, you know, what, you know, what do, what do you hire? You know, do you hire somebody who's technically better? Somebody has more personal voice? We'll get into that. Uh, you know, as we get into it, but uh, I'd love to start with a little bit of, uh, you know, history on on you and yeah, take it away. Sure. Uh, thank you both for the introductions. It's a honor to be here. Big fan of both of your works, uh, yeah, Jan, and, and, and we've been friends for a while now and uh, mostly online. And it's cool to finally have this like face to face session with both of you guys. Um, so I'm Jason Shire for those of you guys out there and girls out there that don't know me. Uh, I'm an instructor for the past 15 years. I've worked at Art Center. Concept, I was actually part of Computer Graphics Master's Academy, their first class, as well mm -hmm. as Brainstorm School and Concept Design Academy. So I've been teaching for quite a while. Uh, primarily, I've taught everything from uh, beginners classes, like super fundamental, to eighth term portfolio classes for Art Center for graduation, which is super cool. So got a chance to come in at the very beginning at the intro levels and then to the final levels in the chapters, seeing through the full spectrum and breadth of design and, and animation. And then that's the, the reason why I speak so much about that is that's the part of my life I'm the most passionate about is the teaching part and giving back. And I mm -hmm. think that's one of the reasons why I ended up being a production designer working in animation was because of the teaching background. And I like to be at a place where I can influence others, not only in a way where I'm inspiring them, but also kind of leading by example. And I think that's where I find the most strengths from leaders that I've had in the past, people that I look up to and admire are people that can do the work too. Mm -hmm. Like they get into the trenches with you, they roll their sleeves up every day, they work just as hard or harder to show the team that, hey, they have a point of view, right? A perspective on where the project is going to go. And that for me is something that's fundamental and essential as a designer is to have a point of view. And that's something that you mentioned earlier and was uh, having kind of a point of view when you first come into it. And I look at look for people like myself that have a perspective versus someone that is just copying someone's technical knowledge and understanding. And I feel like technical angle can always be learned through practice and through mileage. And depending on what project you work on, like I've worked at DreamWorks and worked at Warner Animation Group and done a ton of freelance, just like both of you guys have done. But I think that the reason why I'll get hired is because of the type of moods that I paint. Not so much always the, hey, this guy can paint this beautiful shiny spaceship or the you know really cool science fiction landscape. It's about how you make people feel sometimes and leaving them with something that resonates. And sometimes like it's with color or in other times it's with the presence of the work and how it's being presented. And so that's kind of a little bit of an introduction of myself and kind of where I came in to be a production designer because I feel like the people that have hired me in the past have really enjoyed my my point of view. And that's how I hire too as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. In terms of a work, uh, uh, you know, like, you know, uh, what's the brief journey of like, like you, you know, you went to school and then, right. You know, what was that journey, you know, in terms of work? Well, it was kind of weird. I, I started off working, uh, studying biology and medicine. Oh, wow. uh, my, my father, is a, he started off as an OBGYN. My mom oh. was a, a nurse working in OB as well. 
and my brother's a nurse anesthetist, so he does general anesthesia. And my all of my sisters, pretty much my entire family is all medical. And I was the only person that kind of became the black sheep of the family. <laughs> black <laughs> sheep. Because I was sitting in the back of the class drawing all the time. And even though I was in biology, I was but I was drawing, you know, the anatomy and breaking down the anatomy in, in the drawn form. And I was like, this is kind of what I really like to do. I don't really mm -hmm. like all the science, science and math, uh, breaking things down in numbers. And I always found myself more of an analytical visual thinker. Mm -hmm. And so it was really cool to kind of take both of those parts, the some of what I learned in biology and apply it to what I do in art. And I think all of my teachers kept pushing me that direction too anyway. They're like, hey, you're really good at math, but you're much better at this. You should go that direction. <laughs> wow, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah. And then so um, what was your first job? Uh, my first job, first job was at McDonald's. <laughs> of all jobs. <laughs> I worked at McDonald's. I worked at drive through I was in the freezer. I uh, I made fries. I was, you know, it was a whatever, whatever job following that. After working there for a year, I worked at Taco Bell for a year. Uh, and I was a bag boy at Ralph's. Uh, I've done tons of weird, odd jobs. Uh, I was the guy that ripped open the boxes at night at Ralph's when everybody else was sleeping, kind of doing I the vampire this... hour. Sorry. I assume this was like before your, your uh, you know, you finished school or... or... This was all kind of in early high school. I started working when I was 14, and I've done uh, okay. so many odd jobs. And, and then finally, when I got into the arts, was probably at the very end of high school. I had a teacher named Donna Banning, who was a, a mentor of mine, that said, hey, you should be going to, a, to Art Center. Oh. You draw really well. And mm. I was good at ceramics. I was good at, at working with my hands. And so I just mm. took her class over and over again from the beginning of high school to the very end of high school. I just wanted to oh, keep, nice. keep learning from her because she was like, hey, you're going to do something with this. Keep using your hands. Keep drawing. Keep painting. Keep sculpting. And I think that's where it really helped me kind of find my place where I was going to go with my career early on. Wow. You know? yeah. Did you end up going to Art Center? I did, but later I went to... So my path was... Uh, the high school I went to was El Medina High School for three years. That's in Orange County. I graduated from Irvine High School. Following that, I went to Cal State Fullerton. And after Cal State Fullerton, just for a year, I was studying fine arts illustration. Then I went into the Art Institute of California, Orange County for 3D animation and mm. 2D animation. And then I was like, this is not what I want to do either. So I went to Art Center following that. And I was going for a year for my master's. And this was back when Scott Robertson was still there. Mm -hmm. And he left as the chair and I was like, I don't think I need to be here anymore. And I've got my first job working in games. And Did you the graduate? Very, I graduated with my bachelor's oh, from, okay. and, but I, I got my first year in for my master's and then I left because it was too expensive to stay ah, at Art Center. Mm, mm, I think mm, it was like twenty five, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 a term. Mm, yeah. So, you know, ridiculous. I couldn't afford it. Yeah. So, and, and then you, you said you got before you even had you know finished you got a job in games i did i had a friend and i was mind you guys i was working a full-time job in loan consulting at the time <laughs> which is super weird <laughs> and i was answering phones and calling people from lending lending tree applications just to help them refinance their houses and this is during like the housing crisis so i have a very odd checkered past <laughs> with well with, i mean like, so, so this weird is jobs yeah so this is because you were, you know, working and going to school at the same time kind of thing. Correct. Yeah. And um, I was kind of brought up with the mentality that, you know, you can't be just sitting idle. You have to earn your own money. My, my parents like embedded that in me. Mm -hmm. And so um, even though I wasn't doing art as my full time thing, I was still drawing and painting every single night. And wow. I was falling to sleep with a pen in my hand sometimes because I just wanted to get better at what I was doing, honing my craft. And I think that's what. Get that got that drive in me and i still feel that voracious about art and design like i had that in my mind if i'm not doing it i'm thinking about it if i'm not thinking about it i'm sleeping and dreaming about it that's just kind of who i am it's in me as a person that's awesome yeah. that's awesome so so then first job was games you know i worked at double through, you know your first job yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, my first job was with uh the studio that was called shiny entertainment they did earthworm gym oh yeah. and with Dun Doug to Naples. And then I was working on a project uh, called G.I. Joe Rise of the Cobra, which is a video game 
based off of a really bad movie. Sorry about the people who made that movie. Uh, and then I worked on another game, which which was with the Collective, because Collective and Shiny merged together, and they became Double Helix. Mm-hmm. And they're an amazing studio, don't get me wrong. I love everybody there was such a brilliant talent. But the games that they were getting at that, at that point were kind of like second-rate games. They weren't like A-listing games. And then from there, I was like, oh, I got to get a, get another gig. And I've always loved film. So I looked at uh, DreamWorks Animation. They had a little hiring table, a booth at Seagraph. And this was early 2007 when I, I had a printed book. I actually made a book for myself. And I was old school. I didn't want to have a thumb drive. I didn't want to have an iPad. I wanted to have a physical book that I printed mm-hmm. and bound myself that I can hand over to the studio that I wanted to work at. And because I had saw Prince of Egypt, I was blown away by that movie. It, it, the, the technical mastery of animation, background painting, you know, 2D animation that was in that film blew my mind. And they were doing something different with like the cinematic aspect of animation that I didn't see at a lot of other places. Like at Disney, you know, Disney was doing it, but they were taking it to this new level. They were changing the visual style of animation with Prince of Egypt. So I was like, I want my book to go to them. So I crafted my portfolio to kind of fit their visual style, the way they use color, the way that they use shapes. And I handed it over to them and I just kind of let it go. Went back to work six months later. I get a call Mm. midday, lunchtime, you know, I'm like, Who's that? I've never seen this number. Just let it go to voicemail. <laughs> oh. And then I, and then I, and I'm sitting in my office, and I got tempted to see who it was, so I just kind of put it up in my ear. My leads in my office with me. I was a junior concept artist at the time, and my lead sitting in the same office, and I'm like kind of listening, and it's like this HR lady from DreamWorks, and I lost my shit. I'm like, I got an important phone call. I got to call this person back. <laughs> I went back into the office the next day because I was so excited. I couldn't sit there. I was just like vibrating with excitement because I had an interview <laughs> that Friday. So I said, Hey, I'm really sorry. I'm not feeling good. <laughs> Called them back. <laughs> and I always got my work done no matter what, but it was just that day. I was so excited. And I, that Friday I went in, handed my book to David James, who was production designer on monsters versus aliens. And also, um, Hamid, who was the producer on, on uh, Kung Fu Panda mm. at the time. Mm-hmm. And that was my first job getting into animation was on Kung Fu Panda when James Baxter was doing the opening sequence. They had a special called Secrets of the Furious Five and they hired me to be a background painter on that and like the rest is history. Nice. And and is this the first Kung Fu Panda? The first Kung Fu Panda, oh, 2008. Oh. Yeah. The best one. Yeah, that's the best one yes, for sure. Exactly. So you've been, yeah. how long have you been at DreamWorks? I was at DreamWorks from 2008 to 2014 and then I was let go. Mm. And it was because of the restructuring of the studio. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I was kind of the first wave mm-hmm. of people to be let go. And it was kind of difficult because I'm, I'm a studio man. Once I get into a studio, I like hang my hat at that place. I, I like nested in that place. I had all my books. And I mean, you guys can get a little sneak peek of like my, my space was set up like this, all my books everywhere and mm-hmm. all my posters. And mm-hmm. it was just me. Like I just made it feel like myself. So when I went into that office that day, <laughs> And they told me I was leaving. I was like, oh, God, I'm going to have to take my stuff home. And I dragged my head down, you know, the way out. But that was the best thing that ever happened to me, to be honest with you. Oh, how? Why? And this is no dog on DreamWorks, but they pigeonhole you there. They're mm-hmm. like, if you're a visual development artist, it's very hard to be promoted to an art director. It's very hard to be promoted to a production designer, too, because there's a lot. It's like it's kind of like the crown, right? you're in line for someone else to kind of die off for you to Mm. become an art director. And there's all these other people in that seat and they're, they're guarding it with every inch of their life to stay in that seat. (laughs) Yeah. And and it's like old guard guys that are super talented and, you know, they make you, they do make you feel like you're the newcomer when you get there. Mm. And it's kind of the cool kids table at lunchtime. It's like, if you're not a big name, then, you know, you can't sit with them. And so you have to kind of earn your ranks and put on your patches, you know, before you can yeah. sit at the cool table. <laughs> and so at DreamWorks, I mean, you uh, you said you started as a background painter. So did you evolve into a viz dev artist or how, what, what happened? I was a background designer and a background painter. So it, technically that was a viz dev artist because 
we would okay. get the stuff from the workbook and we had these two brilliant workbook guys layout background layout guys uh lorenzo martinez and mick defalco and these guys were really cool veteran guys from disney that had worked on like hunchback and stuff mm. and they had these beautiful i mean these drawings were gorgeous thumbnails you know like this size but they would draw them really small and then blow them up on a xerox machine like double the size and then they would digitize them so we can background paint them it was just like this really old school mm, kind of like like yeah, photocopy yeah. multiply layer kind of old school system and i really enjoyed it because it felt like i was in the old days you know mm. making movies and uh painting backgrounds for the, for these guys and working underneath ramon zebach who was the production designer of panda and tang hang who was the art director was such an inspiration because the artwork was all over the walls and it was, it just felt like a real art department. So it was a very inspiring experience being there. So, so just, just, just as a, a little bit of a clarification, you know, I, I think, um, what is really VizDev? Because, you know, from where sure. we come from, a lot of times we don't, we don't really yet actually call it VizDev in live action. So, you know, right. VizDev for those of you who might want to know what, what, what exactly is it? There's two different definitions for VizDev. There's VizDev for the two ways to different ways to explain it. Mm -hmm. So from a live action perspective, conceptual design is the word that you'll normally hear. Right. And needless to say, conceptual design kind of follows everything. You're doing graphics, you're doing sketches, and you're also following something from blue sky face all the way to advertising and marketing. And it depends on what studio you work for. I find that Marvel is probably one of the only studios that I can truly call a visual development department because Marvel actually is doing animation, but for a live action purpose. So they're actually creating visual effects, costuming, you know, backgrounds and environments, full worlds. It's world building. Mm -hmm. Visual development for animation is very similar, but I feel like the process lasts a lot longer than animation. Mm -hmm. So the blue sky phase is a lot longer, generally for feature. For the incubation time for VizDev on a TV series is a lot shorter. It's generally six months. But for animation, it can last two years. Mm. And just visual development process, Blue Sky. Wow. And once you get into the production phase, the cycle of production can last two and a half to three years, depending on the show. There were people that were on Punk Kung Fu Panda that were on it for five years wow. before the, the movie was, was actually considered a, a final cut. That's a lot of pandas. To draw. A lot of pandas, <laughs> and and Ramon Zebach, I I God bless that guy's soul. He was on Panda One for probably six years, and then he was on Panda Two and Three. <laughs> so you know that poor guy probably spent his half of his career now working on Kung Fu Panda. <laughs> you know, so that's that's, that's a, kind of yeah, it's nuts. Could really, well, I mean, it's a good property, but I mean, I'm sure that at some point, you know, yeah, you get kind of because I mean, the funny thing is, you know, I talk to some people, and, and a lot of people usually ask me the same question, and you know, I usually can answer obviously what I think VizDev is, but man, I'm really finding out that you know the the stuff that I've been doing lately, I mean, in live action, it's not actually even Viz de visual development; it's more yeah. just like making you know cool paintings to get the director to buy off and gotcha. there's not a yeah. whole lot of you know taking the set and really breaking it down for months like see yeah that's i think that's where visual development gets its name is because you're literally developing the visual yeah. from start yeah. to finish and you're creating a blueprint for someone downstream generally a modeling department mm -hmm. and a surfacing department even animation you're guiding animation and how animation is going to work for the final shot so it's like you're seeing every single component until it actually goes into marketing and you're doing like marketing posters and like lighting keys for final shots and luster. And luster is like when you get into the color correction phase and start color correcting the image so it mm -hmm. looks like has some sense of continuity to it. Even mm -hmm. the kind of grain you put on the final image, we're, we're art directing that to the, to the utmost. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a lot of work to get it through the whole wheel mm -hmm. to the end. So you were saying that it was a good thing that you got let go from DreamWorks, which I, I can relate because, I mean, I when I left ILM, I mean, I basically had a half a tear in my eye. I was like, oh, crap, you know. Mm -hmm. um, what, so why was it a good thing? I'm a firm believer that when, when a door closes, many open. And that was so much the case after that. 
it was the door closed up and I was like I said I left with my head down but then I, when I looked up there was all of these amazing doors open there was doors open in games in theme park working for live action working for you know animation again and I said hey I you know maybe I want to go back to games for a little while because I wanted to get back into something that was a bit more adult so I took a job working for Dice and they are from Sweden from Stockholm and mm-hmm. The, the mothership is in Stockholm, but the main studio that like the, the component studio, the baby studio was in Los Angeles and West on the West side. And that was a crazy drive, but it was such an amazing team. And it was a really cool project I was working on. They still haven't released it. And I was, <laughs> oh, I was like the lead concept artist on that. You're kidding uh, working, me? They, they haven't released it. It's been in this like weird incubation cycle since 2015. So God knows when that's going to come out. <laughs> that's the one thing about games that's kind of you know a bummer because like i i did something for a place called arena net and oh yeah uh, and and they were like uh yeah we don't you know like if it came out it would be like four or five years later but it got shelved and then it's like and i'm like oh man i that just totally bums me out because you can't show uh, the work you can't talk about it certainly Mm -hmm. so yeah yeah no i um I totally know that experience and there's been countless projects, even at DreamWorks that I still can't show artwork for that. I just put in a vault somewhere mm. and I'm like, Oh, it's going to look so bad by the time I show it yeah. because my, my skill sets have grown so much since then. And then like, there's like this huge um, half life of when something is cool. And then when it oh, starts hey, to kind hey. of become, <laughs> you know, not the coolest thing anymore. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, yeah. Generally that's, that's what happens with these projects is they just, go on this little archive somewhere and then every now and then they get picked it back up again and brought back resuscitated and brought back to life, you know? So, so it was dice. And then what happened after that? I kind of felt a little sad that I left animation and I was uh, just kind of calling friends around. And my good friend, Ronald Kurniawan was production designing on Smallfoot at Warner animation group. Mm -hmm. And he's like, Hey man, I got a thing for you. Want to art direct this? And I said, Oh dude, absolutely. This is amazing. Let's do this. And I put my, uh, my month in, I'm not a two weeks type of guy. I put a month in at the studio I was at so they can find a successor. I don't like to burn bridges. So I was like, Hey, I'll help you find the next person that can fill my spot. And so I, I did that and I left, uh, and went to, to wag, which was really cool. The small foot show. I was on that for three years doing visual development. I did. I didn't end up becoming an art director on that show. There was some political stuff that went down mm-hmm. and and it never happened for me. And I think it was because they hired my wife on that show too. And <laughs> mm. she's also a visual development artist. Uh, oh. but, and, and so they were like, hey, we're both in the same room. We shouldn't have him be the person giving her notes. And But we get, dude, we work together so well. Uh, we have like personal projects we've worked on together. That entire experience was so awesome because we learned that not only can we work in a professional setting, but we can also have a very serious relationship too. And my wife, like that's her, that's her space back there. And she works with me all day long and she's in meetings. We, we trade off on the iPad if we have another meeting and we want to share the room and we're good about that. And I think that's not a lot of um, relationships can do that. And we've really tested each other's patience and professional ability as well as personal ability, having that opportunity and that experience, you know, yeah, that's pretty amazing because uh, most of the time that's not gonna work. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> but but yeah. no, it's great. It's awesome when it does work. Um, it is. And I think, yeah. You know, because my wife's an artist too. But no, you know, we're not doing the same things. But but she's also an artist, and um, oh, you know, cool. we have our ways of doing stuff. But but yeah, no, wow, that's awesome. So so then you were on that, and then then what happened? Then I was uh, kind of lurking around on the Warner Animation lot which is on the Warner Brothers Studios lot, that where they have the tours and all that stuff. Uh-huh. And and a friend of mine, uh, his name is Doug Sweetland, he was a famous animator working at Pixar, was invited to do a first animated project called Welcome to Darkmouth uh, for Alcon Entertainment, the same people that did Blade Runner 2049. Mm-hmm. And this was their first animation, and they were looking for an art director, and then they hired me to be the art director on that track. So I finally got my seat mm. to be an art director, mm-hmm. which was super cool. And uh, thankfully, Rob Ruppel, who was the production designer, hired me on that project. And uh, Rob gave me my first chance, like really being in leadership. So I do owe him a lot for that. It was great. 
Uh, he ended up leaving, so I actually earned my spot to be the production designer on that project for a good year. And then uh, that show was kind of shelved, mm -hmm. which was super sad because we did, we basically designed the entire movie, and then they were they would they were not able to find distribution. So I was oh, like, oh, oh no! Like my my whole team got gutted. They got rid of all the people that were on my team that were underneath my subordinates, mm -hmm. and I was super sad. And I was like, it's just me. I can't you know sit here and do this by myself. And I felt bad because we had a character designer who was like the character designer art director. And I said goodbye because I said, hey, man, like, it's just us. It feels weird without our team. The show's kind of on a weird hiatus. So then I uh, heard that there was this new project starting up in the adult side of Netflix. And they interviewed me for it. And I ended up landing the job immediately. And um, it's called Blue Eye Samurai. And it's being a uh, show ran by Michael Green and Amber Noizumi, who were the writers for The Matrix. And so uh, mm. it's it's a really cool project because it's super gritty. It's a period piece set in Edo, Japan. So it's like right up my my alley. I, my own personal project is like set in the same time period. So I have all the like rich history and knowledge and research behind my belt. So it was kind of like a shoe in. I was like almost made in like a scientific lab for this show. Like <laughs> I was engineered for this thing. It's great. Mm. <laughs> so I yeah, just a uh, funny side note is uh, I think we started actually talking when I saw all your Japan sketches and I would comment on Instagram and I would say, I man, these are awesome. And I would that's when I really started to follow you. Uh, and then, you know, we kind of picked it up from there. So I remember that and how amazing that you're now doing, you know, just you're <laughs> totally that's, a blessing, that's man. Incredible. It really yeah. is. It's like I felt. I feel like preparation and opportunity really do lead to success. And I think that because I have such a passion for the culture and the, the rich cultural tapestry of Japan and honoring that, I think it shows through my work and like taking that and carrying that into my professional career has been so easy because it's what I do for myself. So when I, I go to work, it's super challenging. It's very hard. I'm managing a team of 12 right now. And you know how it is when you're in leadership, you're kind of a middleman. So, you know, I'm taking a lot of like notes from up top, filtering through me down to my team, but also protecting my team at the same time. So and then there's the COVID thing, like the working from home factor that triples the the pressure cooker, so to say, because you're trying to filter a lot of different notes. And so I got my work, you know, have all my work cut out for me and my book. And I what do I get to do today and who's getting what assignment and what kind of research do I need to do? And mm -hmm. it's, it's a behemoth task to do a show and it's an eight hour show and we need to do it in two years. Wow. And it's a series. It's a series. It's a series, but okay. each one of these is like a movie. And if I had to give you guys a little picture of it, it's like game of Thrones in terms of the scope, hundreds of characters, hundreds of sets. And so I'm like, you know, just like an octopus all day long, trying to do so many different things at once. It's insane. It's super sounds, challenging. Sounds awesome. Uh, and, 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 um, how do you think the, I mean, a lot of people say, well, the COVID situation is actually benefiting animation because right. it's not, it's, you know, it's not affecting them because I basically lost work for like four months, like the whole yeah. thing, live action shut down. I didn't have any right. work. Um, right. has that, affected anything for animation or is it really just more go 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 or i think that's a great question because i think that it did affect animation in in a lot of different ways but i think animation has already been kind of prepared for this kind of pandemic situation in certain ways because everything is done in a digital sense anyway it's mm -hmm. a virtual environment creation type of setup Whereas for live action, you have to shoot on location, you have to get actors together, you have to do records. And that is super tough when there's a pandemic running around and people are getting sick. And so records become more challenging, finding a location to shoot becomes more challenging. And so that's where I feel animation will, has kind of thrived. And a lot of people from the live action scope and space are moving into animation now because they realize it, it is kind of an impenetrable force. And, and that's a really strong thing to say, because looking at shows like Mandalorian, for example, it's an animated show. If you really think about it, it's, it's all done in Unreal. It's on virtual sets. They do put people on the volume, but that stuff, those people can quarantine for 14 days and then just shoot together. 
after and very similar to the avatar team you know and so it's all about how you're shooting the thing and how you're kind of protecting the people that are on the show too as well so it's it's definitely changed the landscape mm. no i mean that's yeah definitely i think it, it's good to know because you know yeah. like at least there's an industry that that uh, that is working you know and hopefully you know hopefully fingers crossed that this is just you know going to get much better and we'll see how, <laughs> did, did you start during the th pandemic or before that? So crazy thing was I interviewed the day before lockdown. <laughs> it was it was literally oh I went to the to the Netflix headquarters, the, the big headquarters right there in Sunset. And I met with Mike Moon, who's the head of the adult. They were talking to me about the job and it went really well. They didn't say if I had the job or not. Jane Wu, the supervising director, was the one that kind of summoned me to interview for the position. I went home, and, like, the next day was the stay-at-home order when everything went into, like, full shutdown. And my wife and I are super kind of careful about this, so we haven't really gone out or left the house for nine months. You know, we, we work from home. We, we go. I was telling Jan before this all started that we go to the store for the essentials, and that's pretty much it. And we only stay or hang out with friends that we know have been doing the same things of, as we have. And uh, I kind of avoid hanging out with my, my family too often because they're dealing with COVID cases every day. Oh, my God. You know? yeah. it's tough. There, there was something interesting you mentioned um, where when you when you first um, uh, when you decided to get into animation and you were so inspired by Prince of Egypt, you said you kind of tailored your uh, portfolio to get into um into dreamworks and i'm, I'm quite curious about yeah. that because i mean for, for me the for, for me the the visual development work i see people do on on all these big animation studios looks very different to me than um yeah than the the kind of work that i that we usually do these days in games and and um, movies sure. would you say that it needs a different approach do you think like how do how do you how does someone get into um the animation right. industry do, do they need to i don't know have a different kind of portfolio does it need to be tailored uh, do you look yes. at different things oh absolutely a short answer yes i think working uh in live action for example uh it's all about great great mood and cinematic scope in the way that you present your work And when you do animation, they want to see process. They want to see breakdown. And if you're doing characters, for example, seeing those loose sketches, those gestural sketches that show that you know key posing in the animation. If you're looking at set design, you want to see the ideation behind it, the silhouettes, understanding good shape. If you can get through like a good shape, if a shape works as a, as a silhouette thumbnail, it's going to work as a big picture item. And so it's all about taking something from like a postage stamp level, dissecting it, breaking it down into a functional part, and then putting it into a scene and making sure it all integrates together with the same shape language. Uh, some people that I've been super inspired by uh, working as production designers and also art directors is like Paul Felix, for example, because like Emperor's New Groove is a notable movie he's worked on and like Bolt, which was called American Dog at one point. But his like understanding of line, just looking at line, like get, like strip away all the color, and and just look at the shapes that he's drawing. The man draws. There's not a shape he can't draw that isn't charming. Like there's a charm to every single stroke that that man makes. And same with people like Paul Lassane, and you know Marcos Mattel. Those guys are just pure draftsmen, and if they can draw, they can paint. And they kind of work together as the same thing. And that's the thing that's super inspiring to me is to see people that can just take something that exists but reverse engineer it into something that has a style to it and like remix it with a bit of style. And the best books that are coming out of schools, um, you know, i.e. Art Center, Brainstorm, CDA, are the ones that can take something like a IP that exists, like Frankenstein, for example, or even something that has a, like a fable but engineer it in a way that it's their own perspective. And that's like taking a couple different ideas and like remixing them together becomes something completely new. And that's refreshing to see as someone that can take something that we all kind of know, we've all heard of the story, Frankenstein. It's been around forever, a hundred years. 
But when you see someone do it differently, you're like, holy shit, I didn't think about that. It's Frankenstein underwater, you know, and like, and Frankenstein has gills, you know, those are things that captivate me when I see someone that can take something that is totally uh, ordinary and make something extraordinary out of, out of it, you know. You know, I, I saw, you know, I mean, obviously you, you posted a while ago about Netflix and, and your team, you know, on Facebook, yeah. I saw like a big thing. So what do you look for in a, in a team? I mean, like, you know, obviously there's yeah. different levels of people, but, right. you know, what, what do you look for? I look for people that are hardworking, first and foremost. Like, I would rather work with someone that's a hard worker than a hotshot, that, that's a superstar. And, you know, I, I do pick people for their skill sets, obviously. You know, you want people that are, are skilled at what they do. And I hire my weaknesses. So if I'm not a good draftsman at mm. certain things, I'll mm. hire people that are good at that because mm. I need someone to cover that part of the show. And, and that way I feel, hey, if I need someone that can do these big, beautiful, epic paintings, I'll hire someone like Yun Ling to do that. So Yun is on my show to do that. And he could build stuff in Blender and be, and he's super fast at that stuff. Like where I'm like, oh, hey, can you do a set for me? And he's like, okay. And like two days later, he's got a full, there's like a full set done. And there's very little people that I've worked with in my career that can do things like that, that have that kind of skill set. And then it's also comes with a style too. Like he's putting his own style on it. And I kind of like when everybody brings their own voice to the show because that's how the world is too. You know, like everywhere you go in the world, for example, Los Angeles is a perfect melting pot example. If you walk down the street, none of the architecture is uniform and homogenous. There's always like, uh, you know, building on the corner that stands out from the other building on the corner and all the buildings in between have their own energy and light to them. And I feel like that's how animation should be designed too, because world building is built by the sum of all parts. So building a team is the same way as like finding people that have cool, unique perspectives on how they can bring something together. But then it's my job to say, hey, no, 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 you can't go that far over the umbrella. It's got to sit under the umbrella and live in the universe of our show. And so I'm kind of corralling, hey, you went too far. Let's pull it in. That's not our style. Like, that's not, that's, we should be that saturated. We should be this saturated. You know, hey, the tone of this is more textural. So it's like us finding, and I'm speaking on behalf of my art director too, because I'm a firm believer of sharing the helm too. I've worked with other production designers before that are like, I'm, like the buck stops with me. You're, I'm the production designer but I'm not that way. I share the seat with my art director and we make the show together because I know that he can't do it without me and I can't do it without him. And it's all about bringing the vision together as a group collectively. And the, and the visual development department is all part of that. I let people de design sequences because I had people do that for me that I'm like, wow, that was super amazing that someone trusted me to design an entire sequence for a movie. They trusted me that much. And they said, hey, just run with it. You, you, you understand it. You know it. You've read the storyboards. You've read the script. You've dissected it. You've engineered it into something that works for the show. I'm just going to make sure it fits in the style. That's it. And that's who I look for as designers are people that are strong enough, that are kind of like little generals that go into battle with me. And I'm kind of like on the, on the hill looking down, but also like making sure my generals don't fall and I'm putting like barriers around them. It's like a Roman turtle, dude. We're all like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. uh, in terms of like your, your some of your juniors do you, do you, are there any specific thing or words of advice you would give people because sure. you know I'm talking at um uh, my wife's school tomorrow uh just just yeah. sort of doing a critique but you know I, you know there's a lot of things that I think can be said for people trying to get a job or or, or you know uh, wondering what it takes, you know, are there any sort of things that you think, wow, here's the top five things I look for, or, you know, yeah, from juniors? I, yeah, I think that's a great question. I think it's all about respect, right? And, and for me, I would rather hire someone that it comes with the respectful potential within them, but also the humility to know that they can grow. And, you know, like I've had uh, incidences in the past where I've hired a junior but they come with a bit of an ego because mm. they're like, hey, I'm a hot shot. I got here. I don't need to work as hard as everybody else. You hired me for a reason, right? Don't be that person. Be, be humbled. Have humility when you step through the door 
and show respect, but also be nice too. Because people, when you start to like bash on someone's work or like talk shit behind someone else's back, it gets around, it comes back to you and people will start to see it, that you're not really the honest person that you, so always wear your heart on your sleeve and put your best foot forward. And that's how I am is I always come in a way where it's like you either hate me or you love me. And I'm totally okay with that. Like I'm, I'm good with that. That's who I am in, in this life. And I think that I like people like that, that they don't have a chip on their shoulder. They want to collaborate. They want to be compatible with the team. They're able to be a little bit like fluid. And if something crashes into them, they can like move and adapt to it, you know, and not let it kind of stagnate them. So it's like refreshing to be around people that have the energy that I do, because when you get up in the morning, I'm ready to go. Like I'm, I'm taking the calls, I'm putting the work, I'm getting the work started. I'm, you know, investigating and doing the research and I want people around me that are doing the same thing. So I say to all the juniors out there, uh, be eager to learn, but also be adaptable and respectful to the other people that you're working with because they're going to want to work with you. Mm. And, you know, this is a, a big question that I was, you know, I was looking at some of their work and, and, and I think it's, I get this question a lot. Is 3D important for a junior? Oh, totally, man. It, like the game has changed. It, it used to be like, oh, hey, if you draw and paint, that's awesome. And it's fine. Like, it's good. We could still utilize someone that doesn't know 3D, but everybody needs to know some form of 3D, whether it's helping you with your drawings and your perspective or, hey, we're building assets for the show. And actually, a lot of the team I've built around me are, are from games because a lot of them have kind of a hybrid set up in the way that they approach art. They build stuff in Blender, they're using Maya, they're using 3D Studio Max, they're doing nice renderings using like Octane and even the engine within Blender as well. So it's kind of cool to have someone that can wear both hats, could be very technically skilled, but also very artistically skilled with drawing. But it's all on the foundation, right? Like if, if you can't draw and you can't be a good compositionalist, then you're gonna have a hard time doing 3D as well. So it all kind of stands on that foundation. Yeah. Did you have a question? Uh, no, I was I was actually going to um, segue a bit because uh, you mentioned something about sure. um, I think which is very important. And, and I think um, it's ever more important with uh, people trying to get known through social media and how to behave on social media. And right. it's a thing about um, the humility to grow. And I think it's, it's something so important for, for, I mean, for creative growth, for being an artist, but also for being a commercial artist and working in a team and working towards a greater, a, a greater good than what, whatever you could make by yourself. And that kind of led me down uh, with some recent, uh, social media, um, whatever you want to call it, gossip, uh, outrage, you know, the usual stuff that happens, but yeah. it, it kind of let, let mm. Emmanuel and myself down the path of like, um, how, how subjective is commercial art? And that kind of ties in what, what, what we wanted to talk about, like the, the thing, hiring voice over technical skill and all these kind of things. Sure. But, um, there was some, there's some people who vehement, vehemently, uh, um, um, believe that, that, um, art is uh, art is personal. Art is subjective. Art is what mm -hmm. is whatever I want it to be. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm wondering if the same kind of I mean, if you do fine art, you can do whatever you want. But if you do commercial right. art, um, it, whether it pertains to visual development, animation, these kind of things, um, is it really subjective, or is there is there a certain level that you need to hit no matter your style no matter your personal preference that will be sure. able to get you hired yeah. that will allow you to play yeah. with the big boys like yourself right i mean what do you, what do you mm. think about that i i think that's a really insane question that is super smart <laughs> and, and and in a lot of ways because if you look at it from the social media perspective the part that kind of baffles me is how flooded the market is right now mm -hmm. with artists. And you and we all know that when we first began doing this, it was a very small group of people doing it. And now it's like, oh, hey, concept art, visual development, 
are kind of the buzzwords being thrown around. It's the cool thing to do. And there is a lot of jobs out there, which is good. It's kind of feeding the monster mm. of all of this, all the, the students coming out of school. But the, subjust, the subjective aspect of knowing what is good and what is bad is hard to tell nowadays because the skill sets have all been brought up on this like super high level. It's like hitting this kind of crazy plateau because there's the amalgamation of Blender and all these great tools that are meeting and making this great equalizer where everybody's so good because they can all kind of look like each other and the skies and chameleonize themselves within one another. Mm -hmm. So to look through that, like filter through the noise of all the great art, it's all about one thing. And it always is. It's about people that can just tell a great story with their visuals. And if you could tell a story and have a narrative within it, then that for me is more cool than the super shiny spaceship that I see like on art station every single day, you know, and like the, the, the boobs, you know, like the constant, like, like tits and ass that you see all over the internet. It's like, it's not about that to me, man. Like, that's cool. It looks great. It, it, I'm sure there's an audience for it, like on deviant art and stuff like that. But I think for me, I would rather see someone that's telling a story with their image, like some characters walking through a scene, they feel integrated. There's a story, there's a rich world, there's a tapestry of a world be happening around that character. And it could be just this small vignette. It could be a solace character holding, you know, you know, the, the adventure of the stick man that we always see. Mm. But if it's capturing the visual, the audience is captured by it because you're enjoying the environment with them. And that's where I go, okay, that's that's something cool. It's like this guy or this girl's doing some stuff that's standing out. And that's what I try to do, too, with my work is where it's like, how do I make a texture feel different than the other texture that that guy is doing? Maybe I'm actually compositing in watercolor paper or using real brushes and scanning real brushes. That's where you get those edges. And I'm not that kind of dude that's just going to go share my brushes with everybody online because I don't want everybody to look like my work. It's like you, you kind of have to keep a little bit of your DNA and a bit of your fingerprint with you. Because if you're just giving it out for everybody to use, then guess what? You're just, everybody is Sparth. Everybody is this name or that name. And that is not cool. I don't want to be a carbon copy of everybody else, you know? And, and I see what you're saying completely because I'm a victim of it. You're a victim of it. And everybody else is a victim of this crazy world that has become concept art. It's a, it's a flooded, super saturated market. And so we have to do whatever we can to protect what is ours, but also give back to and expect the people that we're giving back to to respect us that we've shared. So it's like about giving and planning and giving and planning and doing right by the people that you invest in, you know? So in the end, it, it's almost like, you know, it's, it kind of goes back to, you know, what you said at the beginning, you know, having, I mean, you know, to Jan's point, I mean, when we're talking about visual development, it really is more, it's less subjective in a way where, because yeah. it is quite commercial. I mean, like if you can't it draw, is. that's not subjective. If you can't compose, that's not subjective. Or is it? I guess that is, mm -hmm. you know, like, because it, it, it is a hard one because you have some basic rules, you know, like, oh my God, I mean, you know, this composition is completely you know, doesn't feel right, but you know, to somebody else, they might say, well, that's the best composition I've seen in my life. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, like one man's trash is another man's treasure. Really? You know, when yeah. you think about it, it's all I think in fine art, you can really say, well, look, whatever goes, but I, I think in commercial <laughs> art, there are some basic foundational rules. Sure. Sure. Um, and, and, but what, what I also am wondering is like, well, since basically everybody's levels raised now, and, you know, a lot of people, you know, they, they, they really look the same to the lay person, right? Right. So, to, you know, and I'm, I'm a big proponent of this is to speak out. Um, you need to have, you need to tell your story because you're the only person in this world that's like you. That, right. that, that's it. And so that's why when I spoke to you and you said voice over technical skill, I was really intrigued because I was like, okay, I, I buy that. Because I feel that way, but what if they really are like they have the best ideas, but their technical skill just isn't very good? 
What do you well, do in that situation? I feel like that's a, a situation where you're like, there's a brilliant, there's brilliance here. There's genius in that person. And part of being a good instructor actually is being able to take that person's potential and then har- work with them, be patient and work with them and then harness that potential to make them into something that's technically sound. I think. And you, you would do that for like a, like you, if you looked at portfolios and you said, mm-hmm. okay, and you get one portfolio of this person that can draw really well, mm-hmm. but it's, you know, they, they, you know, they're drawing the, the status quo, you know, what's what you see all the time versus yep. the person who's like, Oh my God, that's a really good idea. And those are really yes. good silhouettes, but wow, not very good painter or maybe right. colors lacking. Who, who would you pick? I play to people's strengths. So when I see someone that's lacking in color, then I'll make them into a designer that does primarily line and do, does layout or kind of helps me build a, a shape language for the show. And then if I find someone that's a very, very good painter, I'll use them for color keys. And so it's like playing to their strength. And then I also try to find a way to, to really make their weaknesses grow too as well and become mm-hmm. more robust. Because if, mm-hmm. if I see someone's lacking in one department, then we take them to the gym, right? And we go, okay, oh, yeah. like that guy's, <laughs> that guy's like got to do some squats. He's got to do, you know, some pull-ups. And, and that's exactly how I treat art too as well as when I see someone has a deficiency and they're not understanding the vocabulary of it. I work with them on it. And, and it, a lot of, um, you good, man? Yeah, I'm okay. okay but keep on, <laughs> okay, keep on talking. Cool. All right, no worries. I'll, I, I like working with people. I think that's part what I was talking about at the very beginning of our discussion is uh, slowing down so they can speed up, right? It's like, mm-hmm. it's about taking their weaknesses and searching with them and getting into the, getting down to the level where you understand where they're having struggles. And like for some shows, you don't have the time to do that because the deadline's there, the schedule's there, and it's forever present. But if you can convince your producer that this person is good at something, you play to that strength, but you're also like working on the weakness at the same time. And that's like part of what I feel like is super important as a leader is to protect your team and filter their weaknesses away from the people that can't see it and guard them and then feed them all the knowledge that they need to on the side so they can become as strong as the rest of the teammates and play to their strengths on that. Because, um, hey, man, like I've been there before, too. Like that whole the philosophy of the imposter syndrome and like faking it to make it. All of those things are super real. And I went through that too as well, where it's like I got into my first job and there was all these like super brilliant designers. And I was like that guy that was like, hey, I just started. I'm kind of nervous about this. What am I doing here? Am I understanding this material? But I, I learned from people that were willing to give back. And the other people that shunned me, I stayed clear, you know, because I knew that they weren't going to feed me the, the, the jewels, the pearls that I needed in order for me to, to be successful, you know? So, that's great. I mean, I, I, yeah, thanks for that. And, and I, you know, I, I think sometimes, um, because I see a lot of students and the way they think and, and, and sometimes they will, you know, you have the students that are kind of going, well, I have this voice, but you know, they are also not really putting in the work to get their technical right. skills up. And, mm-hmm. and I think sometimes that could be a really slippery slope when you're it starting is. out and you're just saying, Hey, I got this voice, but you know, ultimately you still need to do the job. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so I guess for those people, uh, starting out, is it as important? I guess that's always the question, you know, is it as important as being able to offer? Because, you know, the truth is, you know, if you start out at a job, you, you, you know, you are going to need to be, uh, uh, using your technical skills to, you know, mm-hmm. sort of, Hey, I need you to, you know, there's a lot of work that needs to be done that needs right. technical skill. Um, and, and so I tell students, I say, well, I mean, I, I, you need to have a voice that, that goes without Absolutely. saying, yep. but, um, it, but that's not an excuse for not having enough no, technical skill. It has it's to kind of have, cause you know, you gotta be able to draw what you have in your head. I mean, what's, but what's good of, of a voice if you, you know, yeah. you're envisioning a blue unicorn and you can't draw that, <laughs> yeah. well then I don't know what your voice is really. Right. Sure. I think to, to kind of like sum up that question and this is just from my perspective so it's not yours it's not anybody else's but i feel like you gotta have a default 
level of te technical ability uh, in order okay. for your voice to be seen, mm. no matter what. Like there's got to be, there's got to be the benchmark that people hit, and then there's the high up level. Mm. And I feel like okay. if you're not at the benchmark, then you're not visible, right? Mm. You have to be, you have to be at the benchmark at least to have the visibility to be hired. So for all the people that are starting off in our industry, you have to take that time and you have to commit to the mileage and get to that certain point where you're discovered because technically if you don't have any skill sets, then you know that person that draws the blue unicorn really, really well will be hired over the person that can't draw it well. Even if that person with the blue unicorn that doesn't draw well put the saddle on it and you know put the little filigree details around like the little main area and the bit, that stuff is going to be ignored because it's not mm. technically designed well. So it's all yeah. about technic technical ability is a lot of the equation for sure, without a doubt. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, let me ask you this. How, what do you think from your skill set has propelled you into becoming a production designer? I mean, aside from the fact that, you know, people skills, but I mean, in terms of your work, you know, how did that shift to this point? I mean, what, what do you think brought you all the way there? I think a lot of it has to do with the mileage, man. Like, uh, it's just uh, using every little bit of uh, technical ability that I have, whether it's building something in Maya or doing photography. And I know both of you guys are photographers because you have those super fancy cameras <laughs> for your webcam. <laughs> but, um, I love shooting photography and that's part of my, my vocabulary and I have a ton of reference that I've shot on trips I've went on to, you know, to Asia and even around the US that I've built this like gigantic library and a lot of my photography is my setup for how I compose and, mm. and, and the reason why I understand uh, lensing and, uh, you know, like if I'm talking to my director and I'm saying I'm doing this on a 24, I'm doing this on a 50, they understand that vocabulary because we're talking about real lenses and depth of field and chromatic aberration and, and distortions. And I think that that's all part of how we do art, right? Because we're cheating, we're actually cheating the viewer into believing they're looking through a lens. And if you can paint that in and you can use tools like Photoshop or some type of a CG tool to simulate that and get you there faster, hey, good on you, man, because you're taking, it is a shorthand, but it makes your stuff look like a million bucks. And if you've done it in 15 minutes versus doing it in an hour, it's all about all that mileage that you put in to get to that point to speed up your process. And so it's like, hey, that's really great to see people that have like exercised that muscle so many times that they're just like, hey, all I need to do is this, this, and this, cool, done. Like, why sit there and be like, I need to redraw this and then I got to put my values in and then I got to light it. It's like, there's no reason to go down that pipeline over and over again. If you know the shorthand word, right? Yeah. I mean, cause when I look at your stuff, I definitely see the, the, the photographic side of things and, 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 yeah. uh, the lighting and the mood, uh, definitely always catches me, you know, even in your disgustingly fast you know whatever good night sketches i'm like what the hell <laughs> like like how you know because i'm not you know i i don't just really paint all that much you know uh, I, yeah. I make images but you know i i'm not ne not necessarily using that tool but um mm -hmm. uh, i've i always remember that that's what you were about and i i wonder if that's sort of you know what got you to where you are because that's kind of the thing you've been concentrated yeah. on as a subject matter is a lot of landscapes a lot Mostly of design. landscapes, yeah. yeah, world building primarily. And I think yeah. that because I started off as a character designer, which is super funny, and because I don't do that anymore. Yeah, because, but I, because I was on our station looking for your, all your artwork and putting it into the, the slideshow, and I didn't see much characters. I was like, no, there's, okay. there really isn't any on there. And uh, I have a, probably a hard drive somewhere, you know, full of character designs, but that's not what I do well. And it was at the time I was learning about character design and about animation, but I found that because I've always been a huge fan of like Sargent landscapes and, you know, of course, Craig Mullins and his big epic, super crazy scenes, but he always painted those key moments from movies where he had like characters in there and the beautiful staging. And it's truly like a Sargent master's painting, but for concept art. And I knew that I couldn't do that either unless all that's all I did. And so I focused in on 
primarily world building mm -hmm. and and that's what people hire me for is for the the world building side of it you know so right now you're a production designer i'm i'm sure does that that encompasses characters too right it does and it encompasses everything everything from exactly the graphic, everything yeah, basically yeah the graphic design you know to where like the headers for the the title we were just talking about our title sequence for our show today and you know i'm looking at influences from live action and trying to pull them into animation and that's cool because we are using different trains of thoughts and different wheelhouses and trying to like pull those in and synergize them. And I think that's the exciting part is having that extensive vocabulary, looking at everything from theme park and how theme park functions and experiential design, virtual reality design and putting it into the animation. And it's all kind of osmosifying into animation right now. Anyway, I mean, look at uh, all the Disney movies that are coming out now, like Ralph Breaks the Internet. It's like, mm. it's everything. It's advertising in a movie. And you've never, I've never seen that happen before until just in the last 10 years. It's pretty cool. It's, it's reaching kind of a fever pitch where all the genres are starting to blend together. And that's really important at where we are. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's awesome. Yeah, I mean, Jan, did you, you, did you have yeah, a question? Yeah, I was, I was wondering, maybe you can... Maybe you can, uh, for people who just don't know, like myself as well, like how does how does a VistaF department really look like? Like who who's involved? And I mean, maybe to sure. to I mean, I talked to uh, some other people how they became a production designer or art director. Like how did you move up? And a lot of times um, I get answers like. Um, oh, well, I, I, I did a lot of networking. I was very active in um, in talking to people outside my my usual circle like i was never the guy who put up the hoodie and the headphones and just like draw 24 7 right but they were always yeah. actively seeking um new relationships new conversations with people i mean um, maybe you can maybe you can uh, uh let people know a little bit about yeah the hierarchy and how sure. how like what do yeah. you think you did different than other people who did not become production designers like yourself that's a crazy good question. I think like the structure, I'll, I'll go through the mm -hmm. structure first and then I'll talk about the latter mm -hmm. question. But I think the first part is the hierarchy and it, it all begins with the directors. And if the director is the person bringing the show to life, whether it's a feature film or a TV series, that's, that's their vision. And what a production designer does is flies at that really high level with the script and with the directors. And usually they're the first to be hired too. There's no art director and there's no this dev artist. And so we're, we kind of run for a little while with the director for to pick up the vision and what is the, the taste, what is the flavor profile of what the show is going to become. And so you're taking the written word and you're turning it into visuals. And so you're kind of coming up with the visual language that sets the tone for the entire film uh, for the project. And then you go, okay, I need someone that can work with the artists in the day to day. And so you hire your art director and the art director is helping you with kind of the getting in the trenches with you and also uh, reinforcing your vision and like, in a way, policing your vision too. And like making sure that the team is following the rule system that you've created, the, 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 the kind of scripture in which the show becomes. And I think that's the hardest part is creating enough of a style guide and enough of a visual blueprint that everybody can follow and having that point of view and that perspective that we've been talking about this entire time and then committing to that without change right. but also respecting the director's vision right. too and so the direction has to trust you because like that's one part of it is like hey i hired you for a reason because you're good at what you do and you have a lot of knowledge about it but it's also hey we also want you to bring your own style to this like we hired you for your style so they're bringing, you're bringing their style with your style and bringing it to the middle. And then I would say the VizDev team comes in after you've identified the style. And then the art director and the, usually the production designer hires everybody. They hire the character designer, they hire all the character designers, all the visual development artists. And that's what I've done. I hired the lead character designer on my show, Brian Kessinger, and then he's hired his team. So the way I like to treat it is if I bring someone in as a lead, I let them hire their people because they're going to be working with them in the day to day and they need to trust them. 
and I'm I'm kind of flying from like the three thousand foot range, so I don't want to like say hey who you do get and who you don't get because they're I, they need to trust their people too. And uh, for me, it's a lot easier to work with people that trust their people. So that's a big part of the show is like being able to like let go too, because I can't control every single facet. There's going to be little pieces that I can't pick up the pieces of the pie to. Uh, but I love that process of the hiring and bringing together weaknesses and strengths. And finally, you have this like fully formed Voltron <laughs> where like you're kind of the head of the Voltron and all the arms and legs and feet and the mm. battle battlements that are attached to it are are perfect, you know, functioning mm. mecha that makes the art department. It's pretty cool. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. H how about that ladder um, thing? Yeah. Oh, in terms of like getting to that yeah. point. It, it, I think it was just having great mentors and listening to my mentors. Like the first day I was hired at DreamWorks, I had my art director, Tang Hang, pulled me into his office and he was the art director on the show. So he was pretty hardcore, man. Like he pulled me in and he's like, hey, you won't be an art director in, until 10 years from now. This is your, consider this your first day in your art director training. And I was like, okay. That's good to know. I got a decade ahead of me before I get to this to the to your seat if I wanted to get there. And then he just kept reminding me, "Hey man, you got to be you got to have your work speak like a lion, but you have to be quiet like a mouse and stay off the radar. So respect everybody, keep your nose down, do your work." And he just kept telling me to do that, and I was like, "Okay, I'll just keep busting my ass and do cool shit." And I let my work speak for itself and not me speak for my work. But when I had when it came time to pitch the artwork, you better pitch it with every ounce of your being. Make people like even if you don't if you're having an off day, you have to fucking believe in it, dude. You have mm -hmm. to put your you know put your shirt take your shirt off, show your muscles, show everything you got, and pitch the crap out of it so they want to like buy it back from you. And that's the part uh, that I've had to learn working in the big studio system, that is super hard. Like the Jeffrey Katzenberg people. You know, the very high up, higher echelon uh, executives, they think that, you know, their ideas are the right ideas. So you just tell them that it's their idea. You go, OK, I'm pitching this idea that you brought to me. I'm hoping that this is working with what your vision is. And it's always about we and it's not about I. And that's one of the things that I've had to learn over the years is it's not about all the cool ideas. And it's like I, you got to treat yourself like a well. You have to be full of ideas and people can keep pulling buckets of ideas out of you. And that's part of being a commercial artist, too. In a way, we're kind of selling our souls a little mm -hmm. bit because and the sad thing is we are. We're giving away all of our creative knowledge and our best of our best ideas to these studios, these bigger companies. But that's how we make our livings. That's what commercial artists do. But you have to remember to keep a piece of yourself as you're making that step towards getting into a greater position. And for me, hey man, I don't think I can be a production designer forever. I don't, it's, it's extremely difficult. And it's, it's not for the faint of heart. Like uh, I actually enjoy being an artist and being kind of like, hey, I get to check, you know, hang my hat up at the end of the day and just be with my wife and cool out for a little bit. But my day never stops. I'm getting buzzed on the weekends, I'm always on call. So it's kind of like being like a doctor, but for, for art in a weird way you know <laughs> it's like we got a fire I mean, to put out <laughs> what do what do you think if i had to ask you i mean this is one of jan's questions what would be sure. next for you you know like, um yeah that's that's super hard to answer at this point i think i i like to, to take one day at a time but i also like to look ahead a little bit too i think um it depends on how this show goes <laughs> And if this show goes well and it goes gangbusters and it goes, I'll move on to season two, which I'll, I would love to do season two. Um, if not, I would like to go back into feature and get out of series again and go back to feature and perhaps production design a feature like I was trying to do before I came to this show and see how that goes. Feature, feature yeah, animation, no, you um, know it. Ah. Yeah, feature animation or live action too. I would love to work in live action as well. Yeah. It's funny because... Um... That's, you know, a lot of people have asked me, you know, like, do I want to go production design? And that's the last thing I would want to do just because I'm like, look, just leave me in my room. I'm the one that wants to put on the hoodie <laughs> and just let me do my thing. Like, I don't want to talk to no 
I, I, yeah. can't, I just, I don't have the patience, uh, or you know, anymore. I'm just like, you know, just, yeah, just leave me alone, and and I'll give you what you know. Hopefully, you like, but I mean, you know, I'm I'm more and more towards mm. that direction. No, but, but I mean, there's nothing. Um, but that's why sorry, it's interesting. Sorry. Go ahead, <laughs> sorry, sorry, please go ahead. No, that's oh, great. Oh. We're dealing with the delay here, okay. the audio delay. Um, uh, please finish. Please finish. Yeah, continue. Yeah, I. I no, go ahead, because I, I forgot what ah, I was Oh, my gosh, I interrupted you. Sorry. No, I was just going to say that there's nothing wrong with putting your hoodie up and, and listening to headphones, right? It's, it's, I'm not saying, I'm, I, I didn't want to indicate that being an artist is somehow below uh, a production designer. I no, mean, in, in the hierarchy of a movie, it is, but um, it, just in terms of, of what you want to achieve in life, right? I mean, you, you said very early on, Jason, that you, you've... You, you wanted to to have that that ability to to help others and and I mean make something bigger than uh, just you can do by yourself, right? And that's a very admirable Absolutely. task because it, it comes with a lot of sacrifice. But I mean, same way the other way, right? It does. Um, well, you do the production design, so you can't be an artist right now, right? But then if you want to be an artist, you can't be a production designer at the same time. It's, it's a very difficult choice to make because you have to give up one or the other. Yeah, mm, I think actually, I get the sorry, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm just going to I'm, I'm just going to cut that real quick just just because I, I, I want to piggyback off of that is do you do any art as a production designer? Every day, every day. Yeah, I, I do more art sometimes than my team does <laughs> because because I'm set doing the style guide. I'm creating the lookbook. I'm doing key paintings that inspire the team. And then I'm also working with each artist on top of their paintings to get them to feel like the Crazy. show. So it's it's like you're that's why I was saying like you're kind of a bit like an octopus because you're 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 in there. You're in the trenches, man. Like every day I wake up, I get up at seven. I'm doing the artwork, too. And then I have my first meeting around nine, which is planning out all the assignments for the artist for the day. If they don't have a new assignment, then I go into launches. And then after I launch the artists on their assignment, I get back to doing a little bit of my work. Then I'm in a meeting about production and all the upcoming needs about the different episodes that are about to start. I'm doing scouts with previs because we have a previs team. I'm talking to my director in the afternoon to see if like we need anything or if we're missing anything. And there's multiple directors on this show and there's multiple showrunners. So I'm answering to different voices. And then by like three o'clock, four o'clock, I'm super tired, but I have to keep doing it. I only have about 20 minutes for lunch. And that's my only break during the day. I don't leave my desk all day. And then probably around seven o'clock, I can finally wind down, have dinner with my wife and go for a walk and get outdoors a little bit. Uh, and it's dark outside. <laughs> so it's, God, but, I need but, a, dude, it's nuts. It's nuts. I need a nap just listening yeah, exactly, to this. Right? I was like... Oh I'm man! Sorry. I mean, I I have it like I guess I have it a lot easier. I know Jan's going through a really busy time yeah, right now, crazy. but yeah, you were saying that. Yeah, you were saying that. I I totally respect the art side of just being an artist in some ways more, because there is a there's a disconnection that happens and a boundary that you set as an artist that is really empowering actually, and I and I do miss it from time to time where I'm like, hey, I'm just taking my assignment. Does this look good? You just answer to your art director or your production designer. That's it. Maybe you present your art at the end of the week. And that's pretty much it. But for me, it's like all those little mm -hmm. weird idiosyncrasies that I have to track. Uh, and so, yeah, it's interesting, man. It takes a lot of patience. And, and when you said you didn't have the patience for it, I totally understand. Not everybody can do the job. But there's something oddly rewarding about seeing cuts come back from your vendor. And like, you know, you're with your team and at the end of the week, you're just like, cheers, guys, you did such a great job. And everybody's super happy to be there and is like rallying behind each other and like cheering each other on with the work. That to me, that's the big reward. And the payoff is when I see everyone on my team happy and feeling fulfilled with the work that they're doing and not giving them the drama that I'm dealing with. Like, I'll protect them from that drama. They don't need to see it. I, I hide it with from them with all my might. That's all I can do, you know. I have a I have a no, that's question. Awesome. The, the, you mentioned that before, and it's yeah. something that I I have huge uh, difficulties with, and it's it has to do with um, 
Um, I think it, you mentioned, so yeah, you, you're planning out the vision with the director in the beginning, right? Mm -hmm. And you have a lot of, of meetings and you figure out how does this show look, right? And then you mentioned the, the commitment to not change it. And I think a lot of artists, yeah. like especially concept artists, we're paid to have just the craziest amount of ideas and, and show those ideas. But that also, yeah. I, f I feel like, uh, uh, like uh, traps us in... In a, in a place where we're easily distracted by something new. And I, I for myself, have a lot yeah. of difficulties like sticking to one thing, right? It's like if, if, I'm, if I'm tasked to like um, provide a vision on this and that, and then, it, yeah, that's all cool. Like, oh, I did all of this. But then like two weeks down the road, I see like, hey, this looks even better than the other stuff. So well, maybe I want to do this now. Like I, I cannot imagine sure. I have the biggest respect for, for like people... Uh, up there who like okay they have figured out a vision and they're really sticking to it and this is how the final product is right. going to look like like I, i have no idea how you do that i think it's a it, <laughs> you know that's a that's a great uh like statement because it's evolving as well so we commit to the vision we know that that's where we were going we have an aim where we want to go but maybe and it, this has happened to me on my show already where the next week they're like, hey, we kind of like this show. It has this thing. Do you think we can pull that into what we're doing? And so there is kind of iterations yeah, that yeah. happen and, and, and we have to adapt it into what we're doing. And like I was saying, we have to be flexible too and understand that it's going to change with the wind at certain moments and with the tides and story is going to change sometimes too, where it's like, hey, that's maybe not, that's not the right shot for this. So we're going to have to redo The shot so it's a complete do-over sometimes and i'm good with that i think that's part where like the part concept art part that comes into mm -hmm. my brain is really excited because it's like i get the blue sky again i get to start from scratch and really think about this but it has to still live in the same world language that i've created and and it's about yeah. these rule systems like proportions for example one of the things that i did for our show is there should be a groundedness in reality but we're pushing it like 20 to 30 percent so wherever the characters are interacting with like a physical space, like a doorway, that still remains in realistic proportions. But when you look at a rooftop, we're like stretching the proportions of rooftops to make it taller. Uh, things like that. It's, it's very subtle, but it gives it a style. And then maybe like not every corner is straight. Maybe there's a little skew to things. They did a bit of that in mm. Spider-Verse where things are leaning on a skew. And it has a sense of movement to it. So we're using visual cues to kind of create movement within frames to show where the characters are going to go. Or like playing around with proportions, for example, where like maybe the, the, the character's head's a little smaller than an average head. And so they're like eight heads tall mm -hmm. instead of like a typical character where they're, you know, oh, maybe they're 10 heads tall instead of an eight head tall characters, stuff like that. And it's, it, I think that's the fun part about being a designer is, you know, when there's a breaking point. And that's where the rule systems come into play. It's like, you can't go 12 heads tall because it's going to start looking like Avatar. Mm -hmm. And like, they're looking like Navi now. And that's something we, we don't want to go alien with it. We still want them to feel like human uh, realistic proportions, but just slightly mm -hmm. over the top. So those are things we try to do to like, make sure we're maintaining the vision right. per se. How do you, I mean, how do you deal with, Like if you you hire a lot of high caliber people, a lot of people you whose style you love, whose work you love, and who also you think would be a good fit for the show, how do you avoid getting inspired and pulled left and right by the awesome work that your team is doing? And like, oh my gosh, this looks so cool! Mm. Like this this would totally look awesome like in my show. Maybe I should change it according to this artist or like i mean because you, you bombarded with so much stuff like it must be very difficult to determine like okay this is a good fit this is not a good fit this is uh, this is what i'm looking for this is not what yeah. i'm looking for i mean because i have worked with multiple production designers some of which felt like they had a very solid vision in their head or maybe from the director or from from themselves and some who are kind of a bit wishy-washy like you felt like they they don't really know what they're doing and like where where is this mm -hmm. going and like today i'm doing something completely different than <laughs> i did last week like what's going on right i mean <laughs> yeah no i think it, it comes down to two things for me it always comes back to the director and to the showrunners if it's if it's what they want that's what they're going to get and and then if they like what i'm doing 
and I'm plussing their ideas, it's even better. Because it's like, okay, they had this idea to do this shrine, for example, or do this temple. And, you know, maybe I wanted to push the exaggerated a bit and make it feel more epic. And they go, hey, dude, like that temple is way too epic. It needs to be more humble. It needs to have a smaller identity to it. And you know why? It's because it's serving the purpose mm -hmm. of the story. And so we always go back to the story and say, is this the story we're trying to tell? Is that the right breadth of, of vision right. as to what you guys were being initially sparked by and inspired by? And so for us, it's like serving the purpose of the story versus doing something that's just super cool and like awesome, you know? And I think that um, for me, like working with a team and someone does something really cool and inspires me mm -hmm. like what you were saying, I go, hey, maybe that doesn't work for right now, but hey, in episode five, we go to this crazy place, let's use that idea mm -hmm. there. And so I'm just taking pieces of the parts and moving them around. It's kind of like shuffling the board a little bit. It's kind of neat. Wow, yeah, I, 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 I don't know. I think this is, uh, uh, I feel like this is, one of the biggest differences between live action and animation is that animation is really serving the story and it's yes. all in one sort of house, let's say. Mm -hmm. But when I'm on a show, man, ten t nine times out of 10, it, that's not the case. It's a very sort of, you know, like, like sure. Jan was saying, a lot of times I don't even, I'm like, do you, do you have a vision? And like everybody's <laughs> vision is a little different. <laughs> Sure. And and sometimes yeah. they're just looking for me for for the vision, and they don't have you know it's very different than animation where you come in and it's like okay here, this is the Bible, this is what we're going with. Right. Not saying that that has no room, but in live action it's just like uh yeah. 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 Uh, no, I I get that, and I I hate to say it, but it shows. When you watch, absolutely. I'm not going to name any names of any studios, but when <laughs> you, you watch certain shows it looks like it was done by five different studios. It wasn't done by one. And, and, and that's the result of working with different VFX houses, working with different art directors, different levels of schedule, different levels of, uh, of actual a budget, you know, and like what is built into where they're going to use their money. Maybe it's opening of the show. Maybe it's the big epic payoff at the end of the show. And then everything else in between becomes interstitial where they're not spending as much money, they're not putting as much time into it, and they're finding ways to cut corners to get there faster. And it becomes the ultimate result of the project where you're like, hey, it feels a little kind of mm -hmm. weak right there. Like that, that guy, they didn't even think about that guy's costume or they didn't even do a good job on that background. It was just literally a blank wall and they just barely set dressed it. And, you know, it happens in animation too, where, you know, they change production designers mid mm -hmm. and then And then you can see it. Because there's there's a disruption in the force. Sorry about the Star Wars <laughs> pun, but it, there is, you know, because it, you know you could see that the vision has changed halfway through the film. They've already committed to it. They've already spent the money, and at the very end, someone changed the whole style of the show. And it's like that's weird. Like, I I kind of felt like that when I watched Wally, -E in a weird way. When I first saw Wally, -E, it oh, started off when they go out to space. <laughs> yeah, like it was super sophisticated when they're on Earth and there's this like trash pile of a planet. And then they go to space and it's like the iPhone version of the show. And I'm like, that's okay. I guess they're trying to create a visual contrast there, but it pulled me right out of the movie mm -hmm. because it just felt like two different projects yeah. to me. And some shows feel yeah. that way where like, you're like, Oh, that was a beautiful visual effect shot. And then in the next sequence, it's like, that's hideous. I don't know what happened there. <laughs> and, you know, and as filmmakers and as concept designers, we see it way worse than the common audience. And all the common audience is like, that's great, throwing Poppy yeah, off their, yeah, down yeah. their throat and like watching the next scene, like colors, I love colors. <laughs> it's just, yeah. just how it goes. Yeah, we perpetually yeah. Ruin, ruin the movies of our, for our spouses and family members and friends, right? Like, oh, uh, totally. too much. Anyway, Iman, was there another question you wanted to ask or? No, I mean, I think I'm good. I mean, you know, okay. we definitely answered. <laughs> I mean, it was a great, talk uh and i i mean i definitely got a lot out of we it answered a um, curiosity. and i'm sure that everybody else is yeah everybody else is gonna get a lot out of this um, awesome but jan did no, you I'm have good, anything i'm good i'm good i just wanted to let jason okay. maybe uh um drop all his social media handles or anything that yeah. people they, he want people to look out sure. for maybe you can advertise your new netflix show whenever it comes out so people can watch it cool thank you yeah yeah i'm uh you can 
you can find me on Instagram at Jason Shire Art. We'll put a link below. And yeah. uh, that's yeah, yeah, Jason Shire Art. And then I have a a art station as well. You can just look me up, Jason Shire. I think it's Decap D three C A P. It's my old handle when I used to play Counter Strike. <laughs> uh, so like, I just still use that handle for some reason because <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> uh, yeah. You can, and then if you ever want to drop a line uh, personally, I'm at decapdesign at gmail.com. If you want to like reach out and ask questions personally, I'm always open to emails. Cool, cool. Well, awesome. Well, thanks for coming on and sharing, you know, uh, all this wonderful knowledge. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, thank you, for, your time. Thank you for having me, both of you super guys. Valuable. This is amazing. Cool. This is valuable what you guys are doing. You're, you're creating uh, a rich resource for our community. And uh, taking the time to do this is, I, I behoove anybody who's watching this to continue to watch. And I'm passionate about this. I'm glad that you guys are. And I'm happy to come back anytime you guys want to chat awesome. again. Thank you. So. That's awesome. Man. Okay, then All right. we'll wrap up this episode. Thank you again for listening. Um, if you enjoyed this episode, please like, comment, and subscribe. And if you have, of course, suggestions for new guests, please do let us know. And uh, see you in the next one. Thank you. See you guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye.